you for joining us for this Sustainable Development Impact Session on fast-tracking circular solutions for the net zero industries. My name is Tintje van Veldhoven. I am uh, working at WRI, the World Resources Institute, uh, and I'm Vice President and Regional Director for Europe. As we approach the milestone COP26 climate conference in Glasgow this November, we, we know that it's become increasingly urgent for us to take action to accelerate the industry transition towards net zero by 2050. And we will not be able to do that without a circular economy. It is the missing piece of the puzzle that has gone unnoticed for too long, but we are working here today because after the power sector, industry is the second largest source of CO2 emissions accounting for 27% of all CO2 emissions worldwide. And four materials, steel, cement, aluminium, and chemicals are responsible for 60% of current industry emissions. So to reach the Paris Agreement climate goals and shift away from our current take make waste model, industry leaders must embrace circular strategies that can help them to reduce emissions along the material life cycles. And it's not just recycling, it also includes increasing product utilization, uh, replacing materials or products with more circular alternatives, reducing the amount of material needed, and indeed also recycling materials for new products. The transition to circular economy cannot be achieved by individual actors alone. It requires system change. And for system level change to happen, we need radical solutions across value chains uh, to develop and realize innovative circular solutions at scale. We also really need collaboration. So this session will aim to inform and drive engagement in the links between the circular economy and the net zero industry transition and to catalyze increased collaboration around circular economy solutions for those key industry sectors. And with that said, uh, I'd now like to extend a very warm welcome to our panel speakers of today. Uh, first of all, Jan Jenisch, Chief Executive Officer, Holtzim, Switzerland. Thank you so much for joining us. Niall Dunn, Chief Executive Officer, Polymateria, United Kingdom. A very warm welcome to you. And Jean-Paul Adam, Director, Technology, Climate Change, Natural Resource Management at Unica. Thank you so much uh, for being with us today. Um, we will have uh, our panel speaking first, and then, of course, we will also have a second session where uh, all of you participating will have the opportunity to discuss amongst ourselves in the breakout groups. But first, uh, our first panel speaker, thank you so much for joining us, Jan Jenisch, Chief Executive Officer Holtz in Switzerland. Uh, the built environment has traditionally been challenging to decarbonize because it's, it's very complex, complex stakeholder landscape, fragmented supply chains, long life cycles. Yet the circular scenario for this industry could really reduce global carbon emissions dramatically. And Holsom is a global leader in building materials and solutions. So I, was, I wanted to ask you, what is your vision for the building sector to transition to net zero? Uh, Jan, could I give, please give you the floor and could I ask all panelists to please make sure that we try to give within the three minutes uh, sorry, so that we can uh, listen to everybody um, for about the same amount of time with all these interesting speakers here today. Jan, over to you. Uh, yes, absolutely. And um, Holcim wants to play an essential role in developing or making construction sustainable from housing to infrastructure. That means bridges, schools, windmills, hospital, railway, and everything we need for the future. Um, if today's population and urbanization trends, our greatest challenge and opportunity is to build a net zero future that works for people and the planet. And we at Holcim are committed to leading the way to a net zero construction world. We have identified four critical levers to accelerate our transition to net zero. It starts with low carbon materials in operation. That's why we are at the forefront of green building solutions with the world's first global ranges of green concrete, we call EcoPact, and the world's first, uh, first range of green cement, EcoPlanet. With our green building solutions today, we are making low carbon construction possible already today from Mumbai to New York around the world. Um, our second lever is uh, we are enabling smart design to build more with less. Deploying uh, new technologies from digital to 3D printing. Uh, for example, we have uh, uh, built the first 3D concrete uh, 
printed houses which reduce up to 70% of materials with no compromise on performance. Uh, 3D printing also opens an infinite range of possibilities to build more with less from complex infrastructure projects like bridges all the way to affordable housing. Uh, we actually built the world's first 3D printed school in Malawi at record speed with its walls up in just under 18 hours. With such solutions, we can play an essential role to bridge our world's infrastructure gap when you consider that still 1.6 billion people lack access to adequate housing and sanitation today. Our third lever we identified is to drive the circular economy across everything we do. Already today, we are a leader in this area, uh, recycling 50 million tons per year of materials across our business. And we have set a target to uh, double that to 100 million tons by 2030. Our fourth lever uh, on our way to uh, net zero is based on developing next generation technologies, including carbon capture, utilization and storage of carbon to accelerate the transition to net zero. Uh, currently, we are part of 20 pilot projects around the world, recycling our CO2 in many ways, from using it for crop growth in greenhouses uh, to a source of alternative fuel for aviation. Um, I believe as our world transitions to net zero, no one can get there alone. We need to put all the know-how together, and this is why we are partnering with like-minded organizations to make a bigger difference together. Um, for instance, the more governments drive green procurement and put regulatory incentives in place, uh, the more we can accelerate the transition, the faster we can get there. Thank you so much, uh, Jan. A really exciting uh, experience that you have there. I would have a ton of questions for you, um, but thank you so much for highlighting already the importance of green procurement. Um, and I'm sure that Niall Dunn uh, at Polymateria could also touch on, uh, on, on this, uh, this question because I think it's going to be really important for many sectors that there is both good collaboration, but also green procurement can help uh, opening up opportunities for innovative businesses. Um, I think afterwards we'll have uh, some room for a few questions, but um, I'd like to go to, uh, to Niall Dunn now first. Um, thank you, Niall, also for being here today. Polymateria uh, provides an innovative biodegradable solution for conventional plastic packaging. Uh, a question, of course, in the forefront of, of many people and also many citizens around the world. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the need for partnerships uh, to galvanize collaboration around circular solutions? Like I said, nobody can do this alone. It's about supply chains. So these partnerships must be really crucial. What is your experience as a, a technology pioneer and, and I would say also a social change maker with the uh, polymateria. Yeah, thank you so much. And <clears throat> great to hear of the, the work that uh, Wholesome and, and some of the, you know, the established businesses are, are kind of getting on with. But, but what polymateria are about is, is really creating, you know, from the from the ground up, um, you know, the businesses of tomorrow were were kind of built around a mission that's that's about trying to solve the world's problems as opposed to creating the world's problems. And that's a great place to start building partnerships. And you, you see examples of how mission-driven businesses, um, when they are successful, are able to kind of really tap into powerful coalitions and networks, uh, whether it's the likes of, uh, of Tesla uh, and, and their, their kind of mission to, to mobilize and, and, and you know, take on the internal combustion engine and unlocking a lot of innovation from um, players who would maybe uh, traditionally not have been, have been uh, suppliers of, of the automotive industry to create, frankly, better, better innovation. And Polymateria has looked to replicate a lot of that in terms of how we've approached solving um, for fugitive plastic. So that's the plastic that is winding up in, in the natural environment every year. And unfortunately, under a business as usual scenario, we wind up with 4 billion tons in nature by the year 2050. So very consistent with what we said there in the opening remarks, we, we have to figure out how to punch above our weight. So one of the things we did as a business was open source our IP uh, to show how we can evidence uh, biodegradation without creating microplastic, without harming nature, and also in 
in real world conditions. But of course, it's not enough that that's just our view. We have to tap into um, networks and partnerships of, of expertise around all of those kind of key disciplines, whether that's uh, academic institutions like Imperial College, uh, leaders of the kind of the recycling movement like RAP uh, here in the UK, um, or, or you know, some of the industry partners themselves, some of the largest uh, names in the business like uh, Indorama, Ventures, who would be our, our biggest global partner, or Aviant, who are our, our, um, our partners in India. So all of these um, uh, stakeholders have been essential to really challenging and, and, and probing our science and our technology to, to ultimately create a, a, a better standard, a better standard to guide uh, innovation. And what that allows us to do is bring that into discussions with policymakers around how you can legislate uh, better on this particular is issue, but also with, with industry. And to your point around supply chains and procurement, because there is so much uh, confusion around innovation in this space to have world-leading standards developed through that challenging process and peer review that will allow industry ultimately to make better decisions around what is effective, what works and what doesn't work, but then ultimately to represent that to consumers to their brands in a way that gives consumers confidence that the claims they are making are true and they are able to substantiate them. So uh, hopefully that's a good uh, response to your, uh, your question. Uh, definitely, and I think you. Uh, when we talk about plastic, I, I think the, the groundswell of interest and engagement uh, to drive change in the plastic world is is one which is both a blessing but also a challenge because uh, indeed the the risk of um, uh, of consumers uh, being unable to to ensure whether the claims are substantiated could, could also uh, deteriorate their confidence in the solutions that are there. So uh, it is absolutely crucial that these um, these standards come about. So how do you how do you do that? How do you create uh, with this large group, uh, which is a large movement, this uh, this development towards uh, a standard? We'll work with the most reputable standards institutions. So in our case, we worked with the British uh, Standards Institution, um, but we also uh, reached across to ASTM in America and, and CEN in Europe. We hosted um, a session two years ago uh, in Brussels to, to share the fact that we saw this big gap in the standards landscape, that there was nothing really credible. There were standards around things like composting, uh, and there were test methods that existed, but but not enough to, to answer your, your, your point, which is quite right, around having rigorous fa pass-fail criteria that would, on the key things you should show, like you don't create microplastic, you don't harm nature, and that what you do in a lab reflects, you know, real-world conditions. This all seems obvious, but there was no rigorous controls around that. So we agreed that BSI, British Standards Institution, would lead the process, but work very closely with ASTM in America and CEN to effectively expedite the process towards that standard that we launched uh, in September last year, uh, and that was covered in, in National Geographic at the time, um, uh, but, but ultimately would fast track the process towards it becoming an ISO uh, standard, which will allow not just uh, you know, the markets that we work in, but, but all uh, global um, uh, stakeholders to kind of benefit from having better standards on the back of the science that you know, we have uh, contributed to, to, frankly, something that's a bigger debate, bigger, bigger than us uh, and bigger than all of us. Yeah, thank you so much. And, and um, uh, Jan, if I could uh, just briefly come back to you. Also, this, this, uh, these standards, it's, it is so crucial in plastic, but it must be the same in the built environment where standards are even, I think, more important because people want to make sure that the house they built uh, will still be there as long as the house which is built in a conventional way. Um, so, so what role do standards play in, in this built environment and how do you feel that these uh, circular solutions can also really help to... Um, uh, can can be, let's say, supported by the development of standards uh, and what are the things you run into? No, that's, uh, we, we need to develop that in parallel. I think as of today, we all know that the circular economy, that will play a key role, all right, to make uh, net zero work. And in order to scale up the circular economy, that requires that we go beyond the boundaries of today working in par partnerships, as uh, we just heard from my co-speaker, but also the public authorities, they need to let us shape new ways of working. 
Um, I have one example for you. We have um, in Switzerland, we launched two years ago, the world's first green cement, already using 20% of recycled construction demolition waste inside. That's an amazing product. We literally take old buildings and which normally maybe go on a depot or something and we take the old concrete and we can recycle it in a very simple way, 100% of it, and we put it back as a new resource um, and it already makes up 20% of that cement product. Um, this was only possible with the support of the authorities who adapted the building norms accordingly, and then we could, could make it happen. Um, as today, the European Union will probably take another two, three or four years to also adapt their building norms that we can introduce the same type of uh, recycled product also in the European Union. So this is a big, um, I think a big, uh, um, challenge for us to make sure that the building norms will develop uh, according with what is possible today. We probably, we can already go up to 50% recycling in our products today, but uh, they need to be embraced in the building norms. I think this is a really fascinating question. I think it would also be an interesting bridge uh, to, uh, to our next speaker, but um, do we have enough building debris to go up to 50%. Uh, and this may be different in, in Europe, for example, than in Africa, where there is net growth. And uh, so uh, what solutions, uh, do, do you think that in Europe, we should be able to go up to 50%? Uh, and, and how do you feel that this is, that this would, uh, how could this play a role outside of yeah. Europe where sometimes there is net growth, so you may not have enough, let's say material to recycle. And then what would be the most, let's say CO2 efficient ways of supporting the growth. Um, uh, and then uh, we will hear from uh, Jean-Paul Adam about uh, the Africa region, yeah. um, where the situation, of course, is, is, is different. Growth is needed still in Africa, and how do yeah. we also make that low carbon? I honestly, I think this need, need to be done. This need to be done. Imagine we can literally use every old building, every old infrastructure, we can basically make it the new product, especially when it comes to concrete, when it comes to bricks, we can reuse 100% in quite a very easy process. And uh, that's um, a free of charge uh, raw material for us. So very exciting. We are scaling up now our supply chain in Switzerland. Uh, then we go already for the European Union. I think we can use uh, around 6% is uh, allowed today to use recycling and cement. Uh, it's more if you go into concrete. So very, very exciting. And we really get ready and we push uh, the governing bodies to, uh, to embrace this new development. Um, I think once it's done in Europe, it will go to the US and also all parts of the world because it's simply uh, the right thing to do. Absolutely. And, and Europe is, a, is an interesting living lab for these kind of solutions. Uh, and it's fantastic to hear from you that the, the technology is there, the materials are basically there, uh, just adapting the building norms and public procurement can really uh, make yeah. this big change in this so crucial sector that has such a large impact on our CO2 emissions. Uh, uh, thank you I, so much you for, me, for this insight. Yes, please. If you allow me to add that so the green procurement is so important for us and we see it's so much driven already from the cities. We have from cities from Berlin to London to Singapore to Zurich. Uh, most of the cities, they have now very um, guidelines or instructions to procure green. That's a huge drive for us. So we have the building norms on one side and we have the green procurement and that has to go really hand in hand. At the moment, green procurement for us is more important than the building norms because they lag a little bit behind. Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks so much for that insight. And I think the two indeed go hand in hand because, of course, as a policymaker, you want to know what to ask. And then a building norm can also really help uh, a standard is needed to know what to ask in your public procurement. I think Niall will probably concur that these, these, these norms are really crucial and that the point of public procurement, which you brought up, is, uh, is, is really crucial. Um, Moving to, to Jean-Paul Adam, in, in, we are in a decisive decade for climate. And um, as you continue to build a green recovery for Africa, really beyond the energy transition, what role can circular economies play in accelerating the shift from unsustainable models of production and consumption to models that promote resource efficiency and reuse to reduce reliance on extraction in key industries? Um, because the challenge for Africa is, of course, a very different one uh, in many aspects from the challenge in, uh, in Europe or in, in the US or in Asia. And at the same time, we all need to find ways to decarbonize. Um, so uh, please give us your, uh, give us your view. Well, first of all, thank you very much for 
uh, considering the the African perspective, which um, is obviously grounded in a in a very different reality. Uh, that's not to say that a circular economy is not important for for Africa, and we would argue that it is perhaps even more important at present because the because of the current limitations of the current economic model. Uh, we have seen that the uh, Africa has essentially over the last uh, 20 years um, been able to to develop itself primarily by focusing on uh, extractive resources for export with minimal uh, value addition. And this has allowed uh, very high levels of growth, often driven by external investment, but it has uh, had other uh, impacts. And in particular, if we look at the context of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the disruptive impact has been uh, very, very significant. Uh, there's been big disruption in global markets, for example, for key African products. And while some of those markets are bouncing back, the lack of efficiency of African markets is, is a big issue. So we look at the circular economy from the perspective of improving the overall efficiency of African uh, production methodologies and linking that as well with uh, a, a, an improved return on investment. And this is where the circular economy can, can really deliver uh, better results than the uh, existing models that, that we have, where we can see that from the extractive sector, uh, while it, it represents more than 11% of uh, African exports, it employs less than 1% of the total population. So moving towards a circular economy uh, solutions can help us improve the, uh, the employment uh, and the, the amount of jobs that are created, uh, particularly for a, a young population that's, that's growing. This is situated as well in, in a circumstance where Africa has a huge waste problem. Um, over 70% of existing waste is openly dumped um, with limited uh, solutions that are, uh, uh, that are uh, available to African countries, in particular in, in uh, rapidly urbanizing environments. So the, some of the solutions that we're looking at are through, for example, the African continental free trade area. Uh, where there are opportunities through the adoption of, of regional standards uh, to be able to improve the, the, the use, for example, of plastics, where there is very significant action being taken at national level uh, in a number of African countries around, for example, use of plastic bags. But this is developing as well into potential industries uh, and economic activities linked to MSMEs uh, that can allow the... the uh, uh, creation of new economic opportunities. Uh, some other areas where there have been uh, opportunities includes, for example, the textile industry. Africa is already a large market for uh, secondhand clothing, uh, but there are strategies that are proposed by the African Circular Economy Allow uh, Alliance uh, to address these problems, including developing recycling uh, textile industries that convert textile wastes in clothing for export, uh, also, transformation of the conventional textile industries uh, to green industries that use uh, less water, for example, that uh, use safe and sustainable inputs, and recycling textile cotton waste and cloths into yarns that can be uh, upscaled and therefore reducing the use of virgin resources. There's also opportunities for uh, the circular economy uh, in, the, uh, in, in the development of the African mining sector. Uh, we have seen particularly around the use of, of water, um, there has been uh, improvements in, uh, in, in, in the use of water treatment plants to recover about 81% of wastewater uh, generated by Anglo Gold Ashanti in Ghana. And in Tanzania, we've also seen that uh, the Shanta Gold uh, uh, industry has started using solar energy plants uh, to, to power its operations and therefore saving very significant amount of, of, of fuel. Uh, but I would say that this is, these are very nascent um, uh, initiatives and ones which we need to uh, look at the institutional framework to support that, uh, principally through the African continental free trade area. But at the Economic Commission for Africa, we're also supporting individual countries uh, to establish green procurement uh, policies, uh, which can then uh, create this uh, more predictable demand uh, for these products across the continent. Uh, but the, the final point that I'll just say is that in Africa, the main goal is not a reduction of emissions, although re reduction of emissions are, of course, important. The main goal is to uh, ensure that we have sustainable industries that are created for the long term and that these are linked to 
uh, job opportunities that are meaningful for African populations. And we've seen through a recent study that we've done that investing in these sectors brings a much better return than if we remain uh, focused on uh, the extractive sector. We've seen uh, through a study that we've done that in South Africa, for example, we can get a 420% higher return on investment by investing in these kind of circular uh, economy sectors and green sectors, uh, as opposed to remaining focused on a fossil fuel-based sectors. I think that that last point is very, very strong, um, because basically waste is a waste, uh, because waste is a cost. So everything that we can do to reduce waste and to increase efficiency, there is a real clear economic rationale. And if you say there is a 420% uh, increase in the economic model and the return on investment that you could achieve, I think that is a very, very valid uh, reason for working more towards circular strategies. Um, and I also very much um, uh, appreciate what you said about how do we create really sustainable, in the sense of also long-term jobs uh, on the African continent, uh, which is, of course, one of the large challenges that the Africa faces with the growing population and the, our need across the world to cater for equity and uh, ensure uh, uh, good conditions for all. And then um, the, um, the, the, current, the limitations of the current model, I think, really collide there with uh, the need to, to change to different models. Um, uh, so I really appreciate what you said about, let's, say, let's look beyond just the extraction. Now, how do we add value and how do we create uh, job opportunities for people uh, in all ranks of society uh, also in, uh, in the coming decades? So thank you so much for, for uh, your points uh, there. Um, uh, just very brief, because Africa, we have two, about two minutes left, but African cities are growing at an average annual rate of 4%. That is really a, a very specific challenge. So what can you say um, about some innovative circular economy projects in the context of urban infrastructure and ecosystems uh, to address that really specific point of that urbanization uh, and the need for more efficiency and circularity also in those, in those areas? Would you have a short comment, please? Yes, I think there's uh, African cities are the front line in terms of the opportunity for a circular economy, but also the risks associated with business as usual. Um, we face real challenges around the management of wastewater, around the management of waste uh, generally, and even issues such as, uh, such as air pollution that are uh, currently impacting uh, increasingly African cities. So the, uh, the, there are a number of, of uh, strategies that need to be in place. I think one of the first opportunities is around mobility and transportation. Uh, and a number of African countries have already taken certain steps to, for example, incentivize the move towards electric vehicles. Um, we, uh, we have seen that Africa is currently, unfortunately, uh, the number one dumping ground for secondhand vehicles that are exported from Europe. And this has a huge cost uh, in terms of not only the, uh, the, the environment, but also in terms of people's uh, health and, and, and livelihoods. And the, the challenge in, a, in, I think, a lot of the developing world is that uh, when you trying to help a young uh, or emerging entrepreneur, uh, they often want to get their first step on the ladder. And in terms of vehicles, that may mean buying a very old vehicle for $500 or $1,000, as opposed to investing a bit more money for a better and more efficient uh, vehicle. So we need to change that, that narrative. Part of that is going to be linked to more uh, to more investment in urban transportation systems. We're seeing that, for example, in Ethiopia. We're seeing it in Kenya, where the government is taking significant efforts to invest in, in mass rapid transit uh, options, including bus uh, systems, which are linked to electrification of the, the, the bus systems. Uh, we are also seeing linkages in countries such as South Africa through their own opportunity for uh, production and manufacturing of electric vehicles, where they're putting a lot of focus on that recognizing, for example, that Europe has already made a commitment uh, to go towards uh, electric vehicles and the production of electrical ve electric vehicles in countries like South Africa can bring huge gains in terms of, of jobs and, and opportunities. And there's an opportunity to link that through the value chain uh, in Africa. So for example, a lot of the, uh, the minerals that are needed for batteries that are used in electric vehicles are found within Africa. And there's a huge opportunity to look at that, uh, the, the linkages throughout the resource chain uh, to improve that circularity of, of the economy. There are many Absolutely. more examples, but I'm conscious yeah. that we're, we're a bit tight in time, so I'll stick to that example on on uh, mobility and transportation to start. Well, thank you very much. And I think it's, it's an excellent example that also links back into the discussion that we just had with the other panelists about the need for 
public uh, or procurement policies, but also standards. Um, and for example, extended producer responsibility could also play a role, but also standards on the government level, uh, both in Europe and in Africa, on the exportation and import of, for example, Euro 3 cars, which are the most polluting. If we could already make the switch, all of us, to Euro 4, that would make a huge difference in air quality. So here too, I think technological development and standards will have a large role to play. Um, it, I have to be mindful of time, so I want to thank very much all our panelists for sharing their insights. And I saw some questions in the chat, so please uh, continue to respond to each other. Um, we will now, of course, continue this conversation in an informal setting with Chatham House rules to to dive a bit, a bit deeper into the session topic. Um, so I want to thank you all for being here. We will now go to breakout groups in, uh, I think about 10 seconds, we will all be uh, placed in breakout groups. Um, thank you so much for carrying on the discussion there. And I hope to see you back for a report on the breakout groups uh, afterwards back in this plenary session. So thank you very much to the panelists and looking forward to continuing the discussion and hoping to see you later again in this plenary session. Thank you so much.